I'd like to encourage everyone to open your Bibles up to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, and I want to share a, a lesson with us today that I've entitled The Same Yesterday, Today, and Forever. And of course, that's taken from Hebrews chapter 13 and, and verse 8. It's a statement that is made about our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll notice that as we study together. I certainly hope that you've had a good day. I hope that you've been able to do some of the things that you wanted to get done. And I'm glad that we have this opportunity to be back this evening and to be able to worship in spirit and in truth once more. I want you to know that I have really enjoyed our study on Sunday evenings of the book of Hebrews, and I hope that you have as well. When we started out, we made special mention of the fact that the author of this letter, this epistle, was really trying to fortify the faith of his readers. He's trying to encourage them to revive their faith. And no matter what, don't fall away from Christ. Don't go back to the world. Don't go back to paganism and idolatry. And certainly go, don't go back to Judaism. You hold to Christ because it's the only way to heaven. And everything about Christianity is far better. Better sacrifice, better covenant, better high priest. Everything is better. The next time you read through the book of Hebrews, pay special attention to that word, better. Notice how many times it's used and see what's being spoken of. You know, as we get to chapter 13, the writer of this epistle really has dealt with the material that he wanted to deal with. And so in this final chapter, he's going to share some closing instructions and an admonition, much like we see in other letters that we read throughout the New Testament. Just a few things to encourage his fellow Christians in living the Christian life. And so with that in mind, let's look at what we find here in this final chapter of Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 1, he says, let brotherly love continue. Notice he doesn't say you need to start loving one another. They were already doing that. But brotherly love is something that just needs to continue to grow that we always have to be working on, that we can improve in. And so he reminds them, you let this continue. You remember, I'm sure, from your study of the book of Revelation, that the one thing that God says to the church at Ephesus that needs to be corrected was they'd left their first love, the struggle. And so he reminds them here, you've got to continue in this brotherly love toward one another. Keep thinking about one another. The strong, keep helping the weak. And let's finish this race together. Verse 2, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. As you practice this brotherly love, remember to show hospitality to one another. You open your homes up to each other. You know, in the New Testament, we read this admonition often. It was so needed by the early church because there were Christians who were displaced from their homes. There were those who had gone out preaching the Gospels, and most of the time the inns were too expensive to stay at, and they weren't the best places to stay at anyway. They didn't have the best of reputations. And so you open your homes to guests and you treat them like you would your own kinfolk. And he reminds them of the blessing that has come to some. We look at this idea of entertaining angels and can't help but think about Abraham back in the book of Genesis. But there were others like Gideon and Manoah who entertained angels as well. And it's just a reminder you don't know who it is you're showing kindness to necessarily, and you don't know what blessing it might bring 
your way. And so you show kindness to your fellow Christians in particular, and you use what you have to help others, to aid others. Show hospitality to one another. Verse 3, remember them that are in bonds as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. The writer is simply reminding them that there's a fellowship that we enjoy with each other, and when one is suffering, we all suffer. And just like someone else might be in prison today, it might be you tomorrow. And so you treat them as if you're bound with them. You're suffering with them. And the aid that you would desire, you provide for them. Remember in Matthew 25, in the parable that Jesus gives, he talks about himself being in prison. He said, I was in prison and ye visited me. You cared for me. Here is effort that has to be taken has to be put forth to reach out and to help those who are in need, your brethren who are in need. And so you remember those who are in bonds. You remember those who are going through adversity. It might be you the next time. So you show the kind of kindness that you would desire in those situations. He moves on in verse 4. Verse 4 and 5, really, and reminds us of a couple of, of sinful activities that we've got to be on guard against that really show a high level of, of selfishness. And certainly we all can be tempted by these things. And so he reminds them, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Fornication is very selfish, thinking only of self. And he simply reminds those that he's writing unto that sexual immorality is sin. doesn't matter what the world says. It matters what God says. I appreciate the fact the writer here tells us that marriage is, is honorable. There's one place for that physical intimacy to be approved by God, and that is in the marriage relationship. Outside of that marriage relationship, it's simply sin. And again, we, we can think about the way the world looks at things, people wanting to live together, or as long as we're consenting adults, it's okay. That's not going to make it appropriate to God, approved by God. Let's call it what it is, and that, that's sin. And, and much of the trouble that we have in our world is because people have forgotten what God calls sin. But marriage is honorable. There is nothing unclean or tainted about the marriage relationship and that physical union in marriage. Some religious groups teach maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly, that if you remain single, if you remain a virgin, that you show yourself to be more holy than those who choose marriage. Something tainted about that relationship. And that's not the case at all. We can serve God as holy people, as singles. And we can serve God as married couples. And both are holy when we follow God's will. And he reminds us here about the high regard that God has for the marriage relationship and the oneness in that relationship. But again, the warning is against the, the whoremongers, those who are, are, well, immoral is the idea. And those who are adulterers, he says, God will judge. But then there's this other idea that involves selfishness as well. Let your conversation, that is the way that you live, be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, 
I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Covetousness is another sin that the Bible points out is, is very selfish. This desire just for more and more, it really shows, it demonstrates a lack of trust in God and a fear that we will be without, that we will be destitute in spite of the fact that God has promised, I will meet your needs. He hasn't promised that we will have everything that we desire. Prayer isn't an Aladdin's lamp that you rub and you get your wishes. But God has promised, I will see that your needs are, are met. You will have enough. Remember, I've made the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so God we're reminded, is our helper. We don't have to be fearful of what man may do to us or what man may take from us because God will meet our needs. And so he warns about this kind of selfishness and how we need to guard against it. In verse 7, he tells them, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. That is, the, the end of their manner of life. Keep that in mind. It's a reference to those who first had shared the gospel to them and perhaps had gone on to their reward. And he says, I want you to remember what they taught you about Christ and about the church. And you hold on to that. Because that's what God wants us to follow. That's what he wants us to practice so that we're pleasing to him. You know, there are several times throughout this letter that he warns them of false doctrine, false teaching, and being led astray by that false teaching. And so he says, you remember those who shared the gospel, who taught you the gospel first. Consider the way they lived. Look at the reward it led them unto. And just remember that the gospel they preached, the Christ they preached, never changes. And that leads us right into the next verse. In verse 8, where he says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. You need to follow the same Christ that they preached unto you. He's not going to change. And the gospel that he has given, it's not something that will change. And so you continue to hold unto him. Verse 9, be not carried away with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. There's a warning for us again. Don't, don't be pulled away by these strange doctrines. People that want to change the gospel of Christ, the message that want to change the church, that want to teach different things about Jesus. Don't, don't, don't give heed to that. You hold to the truth. Those that are practicing those things, it has brought them no benefit at all. You know, the Apostle Paul in his teaching would explain when it came to the eating of different things, such as meats. He says it, it's not a profit if you abstain from it, and it's not a benefit if you eat it. That's not what the kingdom is about. But there were some who evidently were trying to make it about that. That could make you more holy if you ate a certain kind of diet or if you abstained from certain things. Certainly Judaism had that dietary code connected with it. But he warns about how that's of no benefit of all. Instead, he says it's a good thing 
that the heart be established with grace. Martha Stewart thought she came up with that idea. Well, the Lord had it a long time ago. He could tell us the things that are good, and it's a good thing for our hearts to be established with grace. The grace that's found in Christ, the grace that is in the message of the gospel, that's what he's talking about. You hold to him. Verse 10, he says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. He's making a comparison and a, a contrast here between Christianity and, and Judaism, between the new covenant and, and the old. And when he talks about the fact that we have an altar, he's not talking about a literal altar of stone or, or even a table or anything like that. But what's offered on an altar, the sacrifice. It is the sacrifice of Christ that we have. And those who are practicing Judaism, they are not able to partake of the benefits of that sacrifice benefits of his blood now they could if they would reject Judaism and come to Christ but as long as they keep holding to that old covenant they had no part in Christianity you see the contrast continuing there in verse 11 where he talks about well verse 10 those who serve at the tabernacle the priests serve there but all those who practice Judaism through the priest, were included in this, that they had no part with the sacrifice that Christ has offered. In verse 11, when he mentions these animals that were sacrificed, that their bodies were taken outside the camp, it, it's a reference to what happened on the Day of Atonement. Normally, the, the bodies of animals were consumed upon the, the altars, but not on that day. The blood was taken in, but, but the body of the animal was taken outside of the city. And there it would be burned, be destroyed. Well, in like manner, he makes reference unto Christ. And again, and we've talked about this throughout our study. Here's this foreshadowing. You see God's plan unfolding. Why would God have them take that animal outside the camp? on that day? Why did he have them observe the Day of Atonement the way that he did? It was pointing toward the sacrifice of Christ and how he would suffer for us outside the city. For there we're told, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. That's where they performed their, their crucifixion. Jesus was condemned in the city, but he was taken outside the city, and there he lays down his life for us. Why would anyone want to go back to Judaism, a group that really tried to turn Jesus into an outcast? They were the ones who called for him to be crucified causing him to be taken outside the city to suffer for us. No, they're not able to partake of that altar, that sacrifice. That is Christ. He says in verse 13 to his fellow Christians, Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Remember, crucifixion was something that was reserved for traitors, for, for criminals, for slaves. And so there's the reproach of the cross. And yet we look at the cross today and we see the wonderful blessings that come our way through Christ and his sacrifice. He reminds us in verse 14, For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. We're not going to continue offering animal sacrifices like they did under the old covenant. But we still are going to offer sacrifice. The fruit of our lips is an example of that. Our worship, our praise unto God. Folks, I really want to commend you for your efforts when it comes to our singing during this time. I I had an older mask. I guess I'd used it before, and it was a little bit flimsier this morning. And when I was singing, Craig was leading those songs, I felt like I was waterboarding myself. I mean, that thing just came in and came out, and I I couldn't get my air. And It's an effort, and I know that it is. And I know it's hot and all that kind of stuff, but we want to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, our singing, our prayers, our worship unto God. That's part of our our sacrifice unto Him. But that's not all. Look at verse 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. It's not just our worship that we're going to give as sacrifice, but it's the way we're going to live our lives. The efforts that we put forth daily, seeking to do good as Christ went about doing good. Helping others. This is part of our sacrifice unto him as well. I remember Brother Ira North years ago telling a story about a little boy who came to the doors of the of the church building knocked on the door and he looked up at the preacher who'd opened the door for him and he said preacher is this the church what helps folks he said yes it is this is the church what helps folks well i hope that's what people think about us here and i'm not talking about just folks who come to the door of this building But as we go out, we're the church. And we're going to be the church what helps folks. And we're going to do good. It's part of our sacrifice in our service to Christ. Not just our worship, but the way that we live in doing good. Verse 17, he gives this reminder. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you can't help but think about those who serve as elders when you read this passage at least I can't and it's simply a reminder maybe they were having some trouble and he is trying to tell those who who might be causing the difficulty to remember Remember the the role that they have and those who are serving as as leaders over them. Those who are watching for your soul. You you submit to them. Now that's not a rubber stamp that you obey whatever they say no matter what. We know that our first commitment is to obey God. Always to obey God rather than men. But as they lead us and they're Leading is in the way of God. It's according to his word, not in violation of his word. We have that responsibility to submit unto their rule, unto their authority, seeking to make their work a, a joy to them rather than a burden. In verse 18, he says, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. He's really telling them everything that I've shared for you, I've shared with you, has been for your benefit. I'm trying to do what's right, trying to do what's helpful for you, for for the Lord, for his church. I want to help you get to heaven. And so everything has been in good conscience. It's been for your good. Verse 19, but I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you 
the sooner. He wanted to be able to come and be with them. For some reason, we don't know what it was, we're not told. For some reason, he had been with them and then taken away, gone away, and he desired to come back. And so he says, pray toward that end. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. It was that blood of the new covenant. Jesus, the mediator of that new covenant through his blood, he says, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, we want to do the will of God. We want good to be done through us. We want God's will, his work to be done through you. And so he prays in this way. And then he gives that amen. <laughs> I remember when I was at New Philadelphia, a lady came up to me and said, Tim, what does amen mean? And I said, well, it, it means so be it or so it is. And she said, oh, I told my son it means the end. <laughs> well, she had to go back and explain it a little different. But so be it, or, or so it is, is the idea. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Think about that for a moment. This is a book that has 13 chapters. And the writer says it's been in few words words. When I was younger, I didn't think Hebrews was in a few words. Philippians, a few words, four chapters. Colossians, just four. Hebrews, oh, that, that's, that's long, but you look at all that he had to share. It was just a few words. And I've come to learn something about this kind of thing, whether it's written word or the spoken word. If people want to hear, want to read, what's there, then what you get, it's, it's few, few words. But if people really don't want to hear it, it doesn't matter how brief it is, it's too long. And I just wonder, what's preaching to us? Is it too long or is it too short? Is the problem with the preacher? Maybe. I understand preachers can go too long, but sometimes the problem's not with the preacher. Sometimes it's with us as we listen. We may, be, we may be done before he is. How much do we want it? You read the book of Hebrews, and it won't take you much over a half hour to read it. It's not a long book, not in comparison to a lot of the books that we're either asked to read in school or, or we read on our own. So with just a few words, he's admonished them. Verse 23, he says, Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. Here, here's the plan. Evidently, Timothy had been in prison, but he's released now, and he hopes to come with him shortly. Salute all them that have the rule over you, and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. And so closes the book of, of Hebrews, a letter written to encourage us to be faithful to the Lord. Let me real quickly share three thoughts from this chapter. Number one, let's remember the Lord is our helper. You go back to verses 5 and 6, and we're reminded that he has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You ever have one of those days where it feels like everyone is against you? Nothing is going your way. You're, you're all alone. Of course you have. We all feel that way sometimes. <laughs> I think I, I remember a book, something along the title for teenagers. It says, if the Lord loves me, why can't I open my locker? <laughs> we feel that way sometimes. But even when we feel that way, we can always know God is with us. He'll stand with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. 
Even when the world may say you are forsaken of him, we know our God is with us. I think a lot about Stephen when he was about to be stoned to death. And he looks up into the heavens and he sees the Lord standing at the right hand of God. The world would have said, Stephen was forsaken. They stoned him to death. No, God was right there with him. The Lord was there with him. The Lord is our helper. Number two, let's, let's make the work of the elders a joy. That's what he says to us there in verse 13. Let's make their work a joy. We understand that in Christ, we're all equal. We're all equal in Christ. We're all servants in the kingdom. But we serve in different roles. And those who serve as elders, by the nature of this role and, and by the responsibility that is given to them, by the scriptures, by God, they watch over us. In fact, in this verse, it's said that they shall give an account of how they have watched over our souls. Like a shepherd having to give account of how he watched over the sheep. That's a lot of responsibility. I hope that we will always strive to be those Christians who make their work a great joy. That we bring happiness to them. You do that, of course, we do that through our faithfulness, through our service to Christ, and our faithfulness to the Lord and His church. You know my wife is a school teacher, and depending on the year, you know, the number of students that she has, it, it varies. And she comes home and she'll talk about them. And I, I get that. I do that thing where you're listening, but you're not. Because, you know, I, I, she thinks I know these people and I don't have a clue one who they are. But she talks to me like I know every one of them. And she gives me these and they just go and they change every year. And so I, I just don't really make a part of trying to remember them. But every year they're there are two or three names that I do remember because they're the ones that she talks about the most because they're the ones that give her the most trouble. They're the ones that are mo the most difficult. It's sad, I've even learned some of the names of the parents of those kids because of the, the trouble that, that they've given. But, but that's what happens. And here's this group, maybe 25 kids, and just two or three. And in the church, you don't want to be that two or three that make the work of the elders a burden, that make it hard. for You don't want to be the sheep that's always straying off, has to be sought after and, and brought back. Oh, be faithful. Be faithful in your service. Be faithful in your attendance. Be faithful in your work. Be faithful in your prayers. Be, be faithful in every part of your life. We begin to struggle. We look to the elders and they can help us and encourage us and instruct us and shepherd us. But let's make their work a joy, not a burden. I know there are going to be nights when elders don't sleep when they're going to wet their pillow with their tears because of, of Christians that are going to stray. But folks, let's make their work a joy to the best of our ability, remembering the awesome responsibility that they have. Then he says, or let, let's think about this idea, as you kind of sum up this letter, let's keep following Christ. You keep following him. In verses 12 and 13, we're reminded, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. 
Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Let's follow him. If the world looks at that as a reproach, so be it. We're going to follow Christ. I think about the words of Job when he talked about service to God in Job chapter 13. I think it's verse 15 where he says, Though he slay me, I won't deny him. And so we're going to keep serving him no matter what we have to go through in this life. Remember earlier in this epistle, he had told them, you haven't yet resisted unto death or under the shedding of blood, implying that that was going to come. We just read about where they needed to practice hospitality because Christians were going to be displaced. They were going to be forced out of cities, lose their homes. Are you still going to follow Christ? It's not going to be easy. The world's not going to like it. Jews are going to fight against you. Rome's going to fight against you. You're going to keep following Christ. Some perhaps had already fallen away. But he didn't want that to happen to any more. And so he writes this letter to encourage them to revive their faith. Don't turn back. You keep following Jesus. We sing a song that in the chorus at the end, simply says, I'll go with him. I'll go with him all the way. And I hope that's us, that we'll go with him all the way. Again, I've appreciated this study of the book of Hebrews. And I hope that it's been an encouragement to you as well as we have looked at this great epistle. And when you think about the things that are talked about there, I I hope you'll remember that what we have in Christ is so much better. Let me ask you tonight, do you have those better things? Are you in Christ? If you're not, won't you come to him tonight? You know why he went to the cross. And you know that you were on his heart when he went there. He gave himself for each and every one of us so that we could have the blessings that are found only in him. But the only way we can have those blessings is if we'll obey him. That final step, being baptized into him for the forgiveness of your sins. And if that's your desire, we want to assist you tonight. And if you're one who has obeyed, but maybe you've fallen away and you need to come back, we want to pray with you and for you. Folks, it's heaven's invitation. We want to encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing.